thing. So I'm generally confused because I need fire. Here we go. Well, good morning, everyone. Please do take a seat. Now, now I could make an excuse and go, I've forgotten my glasses and therefore I can't see you. But now I have my new version two eyes, so I can see you without my glasses. However, I can't read very well. I can't read. I can read the lectern, but I might not be able to read anything smaller than that. So I need my glasses. So if I'm going, where are my glasses? You have to go, they're on your, on your chest. They're on your chest. Anyway, it's really lovely to be back. I've had a lovely uh, few six weeks of, uh, of, of reading and reflection as well as being messed with by doctors. And, um, and so it's been a really uh, great time of being able to think and reflect on some of our experiences as well while we were away uh, before, before Christmas. And so I'm really thankful and grateful to all of the people who have stepped up and done stuff whilst I've been away. I think you've had all sorts of exciting things happening, haven't you? With all sorts of things happening with people doing stuff. So it's all really exciting. And uh, we have more excitement to think about today. So I hope as many of you as possible can stay after the service today, where uh, Bishop Martin, Fraser and myself will be um, talking through where we are in the plans for St. Stephen's and and more journeying into the future with that so really looking forward to that time together it's great to have Fraser and Joe and the family with us this morning Ooh. and hopefully we'll have a bish at some point <laughs> he was here the other week wasn't he? he he knows what time we are anyway so he's probably stuck on a bit of road between here and the black country so there you go other than that um there's just do pay attention to the stuff that's happening in holy week um, so we've got things happening in Holy Week um, in terms of some uh, opportunity for prayer, which I'm going to be offering at St. John's uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of Holy Week, and then we'll have a service here on, on Monday, Thursday. Um, and I know some of you will be going to um, some of you will be going to the cathedral on Monday for the uh, for the service that we have there. Really exciting lots of excitement as we come through this period of Lent into Easter, into that most wonderful celebration that we have. So let's just take a moment. Oh, hang on. One more thing. I need to do an official thing, don't I? I remember. <laughs> so before we settle into worship, as we press into God's presence with us this morning, I published the Bands of Marriage. I published the bands of marriage between Nicholas Allen Harper and Michelle Richards, both of this parish. If any of you knows any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. This is for the third time of asking. Excellent, let's pray for them. Lord, we pray for Nicholas and Michelle. We pray as their preparations for their wedding draw uh, to their close and they come to that exciting day. Lord, we pray that you will be with them, that their wedding day won't just be a, a party, but will be a day when you meet with them in power. Amen. 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 So let's take a moment to press into God's presence. Whether we're young, whether we're old, God holds us as a child. He loves us with a love beyond understanding. So as we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may we know God's Spirit dwelling within us. Amen. Shall we stand together, if we're able, and sing our first hymn?
The Lord be with you and also with you. Please do sit or kneel. As we gather together, we prepare ourselves to be with God. We know that God's with us all the time, but it's good to take time and moments to focus intently on the presence of God, and that's what we do when we gather together in this way. It's lovely that uh, Bishop Martin will join me shortly, and it's great to have Bishop Martin with us. I know he was with you the other week um, sharing, and he's, he's with us again today as we think forward into what God has for us in this place. So, welcome, Bishop Martin. Oh, there's a ripple of standing. <laughs> Bishop, I don't know if you have the same problem, but I've never get used to that that people stand when you come in. Yeah, that's in no it. other part of your life does that. That is strange. <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful to yeah. have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And really lovely to hear your singing from the back of church and to be here with you. An absolute joy. I do apologize for my late arrival. For some reason, it said 10 o'clock in my diary. Oh. So uh, I thought I was here in good time for 10, but I'm late for half nine. So I do apologize. <laughs> we like to keep you on your toes, don't we? That's basically what it comes down to. But delighted to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, you, can, you can have a seat. Then. There we are. I'll not let the bishop read my sermon before I preach it. I'm going to be in enough trouble as it is. <laughs> So let's press into what God has for us as we prepare ourselves to be, uh, be with God and to come to his table. So we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the commandments which God has given to his people and examine your hearts. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not dishonor the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything which belongs to your neighbour. Amen. Lord, have mercy. These thy laws in our hearts we beseech thee. Oh Lord, have mercy on us, O God, in your great goodness, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out our offences. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Against you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Purge us from our sin and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The collect for this, the fifth Sunday of Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, if I'm right, all of our young people are going to escape. Right, so you're going to escape shortly. So we're going to sing this song, and then during that you can escape and you go off to the, what was the choir vestry for, for fire spirits. And so you will cause all sorts of chaos over there, and we cause all sorts of chaos in here. So that's all good. Uh, if you want to stay with your parents, then that, negotiate that with them, um, or you're in there. So shall we stand together if we're able and sing, This is Our God. for our young people. We thank you for them. 
Lord, we thank you for the miracle that they are. And Lord, we pray that they and we together may be discerning your will for your church. Amen. Please do take a seat as we come to our readings. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is a covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from the fifth chapter of Hebrews, beginning at the fifth verse. Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learnt obedience from what he suffered. And once was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you're able, would you stand with me? Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. Oh, that today we would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, 
it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify my, your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. O oh Lord, as we come to you, as we come to your word, may we hear from you, not the frailty of human words, but by the power of your spirit. Amen. Please do take a seat. Clearly, this is my first week back from sabbatical part two, and it's been somewhat hectic. There were a number of things that happened this week that weren't in the diary before I went away, and, and so it's been quite exciting. But I did pick up on the wireless that our community secretary, Michael Gove, unveiled the government's um, new definition of extremism. I picked that up. Uh, he, mind you, he did specifically stress, thanks BBC, other television providers are available, uh, free speech remains protected and that conservative religious beliefs will not be infringed upon by the new definition. Hmm, interesting. So that's going to be fun, it seems to me. There's some interesting tension because there's the legalism of what they're trying to do here and that may conflict with things as we seek to determine what is acceptable and unacceptable in radical views. What radical views can be spoken out loud? What radical views are suppressed? And what constitutes a radical view? Because I think the gospel is radical. It is fundamentally radical. I wrote this and then crossed it out, but I'm going to say it. I sought a kind of long for a vicar in Forgotten in the Wolves to be prosecuted for being too extreme. Because all he's doing, or she is doing, is preaching the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is radical. And it's massively counterintuitive. Because in a wonderful kingdom of God way, the kingdom of God is both inclusive and exclusive at the same time. And what does that mean for us? Why do I bring those words up? I do because in our reading today, we've reached this climactic moment. In our reading from John, we've reached this climactic moment, a moment when Jesus points to the transformation of our relationship with God. He t points to the transformation from a relationship built upon the law to one that is built about our relationship with him. What's the trigger? It's the trigger is when he is lifted up from the earth. And in this, he will draw all people to himself. All people. He's inclusive of who he's calling to himself. But he's also exclusive. It's to him. Not to a vague notion or to a fluffy cloud. It's to him Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. As I was pondering this, I brought to mind an experience I had at a funeral visit. Um, at funeral visits, I, I, after I've been with the family for a while, I, I, I hand round some different Bible passages for them to pick from. So we've got something that speaks to them and speaks into the life of the person that we're remembering. So I do that. And as I did that, the, the family came to rest, as they so frequently do, on John 14, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And all was well 
as we read through that, until a younger person in the room got a bit fidgety about this. She said, I don't know, what's the problem? And the problem was verse 6. Any ideas what verse 6 is? It's Jesus answered to Thomas, who'd gone, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. She went, that's a bit rude. That's a bit exclusive. What do you mean you can only get to God through Jesus? And that is the challenge, isn't it, for us? Radically inclusive, but also radically Jesus-focused and exclusive. I find it fascinating, therefore, that in this moment, in this pivotal moment in John's Gospel, of Jesus exploring the sacrifice that he's called to, it's brought about, in, in a small part perhaps, maybe, by non-Jews, by the Greeks, wanting to see him. All people. These people are intrigued by this Messiah, this person who is the fulfillment of God's promise to the people of Israel. But they don't seem able to approach Jesus directly. So they go through a disciple who they determine is the most acceptable person that they can go talk to, the person that's closest to us, the person that's on the edge. He's on the edge. His his name is a a Greek-based name, and he comes from Bethsaida, which is a border place. The posh. So we're, we're here in this posh word time, liminal space. We're in this place where all sorts of things can happen. We've got all sorts of people from different places, and different backgrounds all coming together, all coming together around Jesus. So it's fascinating that they come in this way. It was better for them to come through the disciples than to try and come to Jesus in, interestingly, what had just happened, which, uh, just to confuse us, if you look back in your Bibles, actually, John gives the... um, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem uh, just before this event. Now you're all going, ah, no, 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 (laughs) no. It's Palm Sunday next week. If you're in the wrong order, but that's how the lectionary likes to, to mess with our heads. But there we are. What's just happened is they could have tried to approach Jesus in the temple, in the court of uh, the Gentiles, but it was crowded. It was full of, 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 of money changers and people selling stuff. They couldn't quite get to approach Jesus here, but they're approaching Jesus in this external space and through Philip. Philip's unsure himself and goes, well, I'm not sure. I'm not going to go and tell him. I'll tell you what, I'll I'll go and ask somebody else as well. We'll go together. That'll be fine then. So he goes with Andrew. Philip and Andrew go and explain what's happening. But then Jesus does, uh, he does an incredibly Jewish thing. He doesn't really answer the question, does he? He doesn't seem to address the fact that these people have come at all. I I mean, I think it is a bit like, so we've we've got a a service where there's loads of people who've come to church who never come to church. Normally when that happens, we we preach a, quote, seeker-friendly sermon. Seeker-friendly sermon. We do not go into the minutiae of some deeply complicated theological thing in Paul or some deeply difficult thing in the Old Testament. We don't do that. We, we go, oh no, we'll have a lovely seeker-friendly service. Does Jesus do that? No. No, he doesn't. He starts thinking about what is my death and resurrection going to bring about? If I remember the library at Theological College, there is many, many pages written on what the death and resurrection of Jesus means. What Jesus goes on to say as he 
addresses these people is he speaks that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come. Every moment in John's Gospel to this point, the hour has been men- where the hour has been mentioned, it's the hour has not yet come. But now the hour has come. And it's fascinated that it is in some way precipitated by all peoples coming to him, not just the Jews. <clears throat> As Jesus explains, he concludes that I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. When he is lifted up on the cross, he will instigate a cosmic change from the covenant of the temple and sacrifice to a covenant rooted in him and in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. And for this to happen, there has to be this loss. Loss before growth can come. Jesus speaks of a grain of wheat falling to the ground and goes on to say that only by his death will be the thing, it's his death that will lead us into eternal life. And it's that that has this impact upon those who seek to follow him. He challenges his listeners and therefore us by saying, anyone who loves their life will lose it or loses it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That's hard, isn't it? You can skip over it, and it's okay. We, we, we do that, don't we? Skip over it, keep moving, everything will be fine. But actually, hates your life, to hate your life. So often we have to convince people that God loves them and not to hate themselves. But what's this saying? Jesus knows this is hard. He knows this is hard. And he cries out, even on his own behalf, Father, save me from this hour. We'll hear those words again, won't we? As Jesus approaches the cross even more closely in Gethsemane. Father, save me from this hour. If we want the kingdom of God to reign in this time and this place, we know it can't happen fully, but to be a transformation towards it, then what needs to happen the prince, for the prince of this world to be driven out? Seed needs to fall to the ground and die that new things can be born, that can, they can grow. It's an amazing miracle, isn't it? Tiny seed. Amazing what can happen. What is the impact of this time of judgment In this moment in our narrative, there is this voice from heaven. There is this voice from heaven. It happens in other places, doesn't it? We have the voice from heaven comes at Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration, and here. And Jesus says, it's not for my benefit, it's for yours. The hour has come. It is a time for judgment on the world, a time of that word judgment um, in the original language looks like crisis. It's a time of crisis, a critical moment. Jesus, has in de- Jesus and his disciples from this crisis moment have to journey on towards the cross. Jesus has given them and keeps giving them the data about what will happen. He, gives, he tells them what's going to happen and they've got the head knowledge of what's going to happen potentially but they don't have the experience as they travel over these coming weeks for them. They, ne- they then have to experience it. And those two things are very different, aren't they? It is different to know something. Knowing something and experiencing something are very different. I've been thinking about that a lot. I could show you all the pictures in the world and videos and recordings of bits of music or sound of birds in trees. I can do all of that of our travels when we were in Australia and New Zealand. I can do that. 
Is it the same as experiencing it? No, it isn't. No matter how good it is, I could stick you in a VR thingy, headset thingy, and it would be closer, but still it's not the same as experiencing it. We need to experience our journey with Jesus, not just know about Jesus. I do pray that for most of us, we've done that. We've experienced God at work in our lives. We've experienced God changing things, transforming things, transforming us. But if you're like me, it's easy to forget that and start getting into just knowing about God. We need to experience God. And in that, he calls us to make sacrifice. What is it? What's the seed that we hold that he is calling us to let fall to the ground so that it can germinate and grow? We need to lay things down so that the church can grow, so that the kingdom may be fulfilled, brought closer. Here at St. Stephen's, we are here in a time when we're looking to change gear into a different future for us. What does that mean for us? What have we got to let go of so that we can pick up other things? We need to be listening for the voice from heaven. We need to be willing to follow and move where he, our Lord and Saviour, is at work. Yes, we honour and give thanks for all that we have had. And we may take some things with us, but we can't take everything with us. And we travelled for quite a lot of weeks. We had to work out what would fit in the suitcase. You can't take everything. So here, what do we need to let go of? And what do we need to pick up? What will need to stand in judgment? What needs to be picked up and held tightly as we seek to be a thriving community of people who are seeking after a God and following Jesus? We seek to be here a people empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to worship God passionately to experience God, not just sing songs to him. A people who follow Jesus faithfully, who are willing to go where he goes. A people who love one another radically, who are willing to open our arms to those who are different from us, but knowing that we're rooted and grounded in Jesus. Are we able to share our hope courageously? I pray that we can do that here at St. Stephen's in Redditch as a whole and indeed as, others are, as some of us perhaps will be sent further afield to the ends of the earth. So to do any of this, let alone all of it, it requires those radical behaviours that perhaps this passage points us towards. Radical extremism, being truly focused on Jesus and what he has for us, and a radical openness, open arms, open hearts, open in serving. As we do that, precious seed will fall to the ground. But it will grow. Empowered by and nurtured by God's Spirit. Our personal ambitions may need to be put on hold. We might need to remember that we are first and foremost servants of God, not God, our servant. And to do all of this, can we be radically focused on the one who was lifted up for our sake? 
radically focused on the uniqueness of Jesus. Radically focused on the unique wonder of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And can we open our hearts, our doors, our minds to all of those who are seeking after Jesus, as those Greeks were? It strikes me that this is all the least that we can do, given that the Son of God was willing to be lifted up on the cross, that we might have life in all its fullness, even to eternal life. May his name be glorified. Amen. Amen. If you're able, would you stand with me? And to use uh, the Philippians 2 passage as our creed today as we think about how Jesus in his divinity did not cling to God but was willing to let go. What is it that you need to let go of today? Just take a moment as we come to this. Perhaps you, you might want to do that. Just hold out your hands. What are you holding in your hands that you need to let go of today? So come Holy Spirit. Come bless us. Help us to know that you love us and that with gentleness you call us to let some things that we hold tightly to to slip through our fingers and fall to the ground. Some things you give us that are precious you call us to plant on. So come Holy Spirit. Bless your people. So let's say together, though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please sit or kneel as we come to our time of prayer. <laughs> In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Heavenly Father, in accordance with the new covenant which you made with the people of Israel and of Judah, which, through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, was extended to all nations, put your laws in our minds and write them on our hearts, we pray that we and all humanity shall know you, and that you shall be our God, and we shall be ever and only your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worldwide church, Lord, this week thinking of the church in Lund, Sweden, and Bishop Johann Tiberg, for Cashel, Osserai and Ferns in Ireland, and Bishop Adrian Wilkinson, for the Church in Wales and Bishop Andy Johnson, and for the Diocese of Ely. In Worcestershire, we pray for Bishop, Bishops John and Martin and all ordained and lay people who lead worship and preach and teach your holy word. 
We pray and give you thanks for the work of all who give of their time and talents in so many ways to promote the work of the church. Be they church warden, office staff, bell ringers, flower arrangers, and those who work behind the scenes whose work is not always noticed. We pray for the success of the renewal project taking place in the greater Dudley area, in St. John's Church in Hales Owen, and here in Redditch, and for the work of all who are involved in their preparation. We give thanks for the presence of Bishop John and Fraser and for the return of Paul from his sabbatical to host the meeting to be held after this service to discuss and give us more information about the renewal project here. We ask your blessing on that meeting, Lord, that it may inspire us as we look forward to Fraser's arrival and the work on mission and building work begins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the many regions of the world where war, famine, climate change and political pressures, pressures place intolerable burdens on the lives of their inhabitants. We think again of Ukraine as the war there drags on without any, there being any sign that an end is in sight and of the situation in Gaza and the hundreds of thousands of people displaced by the war there. Give wisdom to the leaders on both sides of the conflict that a ceasefire may be er achieved, humanitarian aid allowed into Gaza to relieve the suffering of the people and the remaining Israeli hostages be returned to their loved ones. In Britain, we pray for the homeless and for those who are struggling to survive in the present challenging economic climate. And thank you for the work of Crisis, the Food Bank, and all other organizations which offer help to those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We hold before you, Lord, all those who are suffering Ill illness or recovering from illness. We think especially of Tom, Susan, Cora, Sarah, Vivian, Nancy, Christopher, Mary, and Nick. Comfort them in their suffering, we pray, and restore them to health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those who have recently died and their families. Maybe they be comforted in the knowledge that their loved ones are at peace with you through the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand? Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. I'll let uh, Bishop Martin continue uh, to greet you, but as we do so, shall we stand together, uh, remain standing together and sing our next hymn.
bring these gifts to God, lay them on the altar, we bring our lives to God and offer them to him, saying, God of mercy and compassion, your word calls us home to faith and love. Accept all we offer this day, in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the love, the law, and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy, and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love, made perfect in our human weakness. Amen. Lord, we believe. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation. Loving us to the end, he gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. Amen. Lord, we believe. On the night he gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, as we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption. Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Look with favor on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free and fill your church with power from on high. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with St. Stephen, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all your saints at the table in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own.
castle Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a line Inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on, my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a line Inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord We rest in the presence of Christ within us and all about us. We pray that his life won for us on the cross, that life might fill this church, fill this town, We pray for the Holy Spirit to come and fill our lives. 
we pray together almighty god we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son jesus christ through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory amen We have, I think, our final hymn, Lift High the Cross. Oh no, oh Jesus, I have promised. We've already lifted high the cross. Uh, we have, oh Jesus, I have promised. Just before we do that, we have the blessing at the very end, do we, Paul? Yes. Yeah, so let's stand and sing now, oh Jesus, I have promised. I just wonder whether I could invite Fraser and his family to come forward just for our final blessing. You'll all have the chance to meet Fraser and his family after the service and we've got a really interesting time ahead as we discuss what's coming next in the Renewal Project. But just in case you're not able to stay, and as a focus for your prayers, I do ask you to pray uh, for this blessed family uh, who are going to be relocating here and leading the renewal project and leading uh, the growth and renewal, we pray, of this church under God. So, Fraser, Joe, and I can't remember the name of your Annie children. And Emma. Annie and Emma, how lovely to see you. And then 
And the baby, yeah, very good. That's fantastic. My name's Martin, and I wear a strange hat sometimes in church because I'm a bishop, and this is my shepherd's crook. So why don't you girls hold the shepherd's crook while we pray for God's blessing upon each one of them. For the Holy Spirit to hover over them and give all the needful gifts of grace at this time. So for each one of us here, may Christ crucified draw you to himself so you find in him a sure ground for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 